Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world, where it's naturally supernatural. My guest was mentored under Catherine Coleman's ministry and Mother Teresa. Now she wants to impart that same boldness, power, and compassion that she operates in to you. Are you ready to receive? Sid Roth has spent over 40 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. I am here with Dr. Michelle Corral. I can't think of better people to be mentored under than the two you were mentored under. But uh, your first encounter with the supernatural was when you were 17. When I, when I was 17, I experienced the power of God being saved. You know, uh, I was listening to an altar call, touched by the power of the Holy Spirit, but a battle was going on within me, not because I didn't want to receive Christ, but because I think my, my situation, my battle is like a lot of people. You wonder if you go to the front to receive Jesus, can you live for God? And I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I thought, oh, I would love to receive Christ. But all of a sudden, this battle was going on within me, and I felt too hands lift me up. I wanted to go to the front, but but I just didn't know if I should. And two hands lifted me up. And before you knew it, I was in the front weeping and weeping. And it lasted three days. And this is what you really call being born again. When you're washed by the blood of Jesus and you experience that born again experience. But then just shortly thereafter, what happened to your entire family? Right after I got saved, my mother saw such a difference in me. I'm a product from the 60s generation. And she noticed such a difference in me that she wanted to go to the place that I was going. She became born again, and my entire family became born again, and they're still serving God to this day. Something happened to you. A very similar thing happened to me. In fact, we, we became, uh, had that great miracle of salvation about the same time. Yes. And then I got a phone call from a woman called Catherine Coleman. You started going to her meetings. Oh, yes. And um, what did you learn? when you went to those meetings? The very first time, though, I had been, after baptism in the Spirit, involved in a Pentecostal church. I did not know what it meant to feel the anointing. And for the very first time in my life, when I went to Miss Coleman's service, I saw the presence of God. I actually saw the glory of God in that meeting. I was up on the third balcony, and she started calling out someone that was blind. And all of a sudden, the room turned dark, and I saw like a rod of lightning starting on one end of the pew all the way to the other end of the pew. And it touched a little boy who had been blind from birth, and he was completely healed in that service. And it changed my life forever. If there was one thing that I could ask you about that you learned from Miss Coleman, what would that be? So many things. One thing would be about dying to self, but making the Holy Spirit your best friend, depending on Him for everything, yielding to Him, never wanting to disappoint Him, always asking His preference, deferring the way to the Holy Spirit, excuse because He lives me. in us. Excuse yes. me. Yes. You mean you literally ask his permission to do things? Explain it. Oh, me totally. Example. Give me a concrete <laughs> example. For example, every single thing in my life, especially as a minister, but in everyday life, we have to yield ourselves to him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, we know the witness of the Holy Spirit. And so, therefore, that special witness helps you lead. And I've learned to depend on that witness more than I depend on anything in the natural. If somebody tells me something a certain day to a certain time, a certain appointment, I always ask the Holy Spirit first, is that going to happen, Holy Spirit? Is this the way it's really, really going to be? And if I feel the anointing, I know that's what, he, what He's leading me toward. If I don't feel the anointing, I don't pay any attention to it. And sometimes if I feel a block, then I know it's not His will. Well, I do know that the Holy Spirit gave you such courage. Once you knew He wanted you to do something, you went 
as a young woman into a very life-threatening situation. You know, when you love Jesus, when you're baptized in the Spirit, this is one of the greatest gifts of the Holy Spirit. You fall so in love with Jesus, and you become so bold for, for God. It's the what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And I had a burden for souls in China. So I organized a trip in my ministry to go. We were going to the Philippines, so I decided, let's take a side trip to the People's Republic, and I want to bring in Bibles. This is what I want to do. China yeah, know you could end up in prison oh, yes. at that time. Yes, with, yes. With having Bibles bring in it to China. Yes, exactly, especially in Chinese. These were not English Bibles. Mm -hmm. And so I had prayed about it. We organized a group. We worked with a, a ministry that specializes in touching the underground church. And we decided to take 30 people. They were all going to smuggle the Bibles. But when they met us in Hong Kong, this underground ministry, they said, no, these people are not all, cannot do this, that there has to be about nine of you. So we selected nine individuals that would not mind risking their life, be able to go in, put the Bibles in their suitcases, and no, no, for sure those suitcases are going to be opened. There's no way they wouldn't be opened, that they're going to be opened and trust God to blind the eyes of the guards as they look in the suitcases not to see the Bibles. And that's what we did. I'm in awe of what the Holy Spirit did there. Do you speak Chinese? No, I and don't. And does, did any member of your group speak We Chinese? never did. We but never. But what happened? Yes, when we, this very first Bible smuggling mission, we did get our Bibles through. And by the way, when they opened up my suitcase, they were shocked because the Holy Spirit gave me a strategy. He said, put the cosmetics all on top of the clothes. I had no idea that the Chinese guards in 1980 were not familiar with cosmetics and the way women dress in the West. And they were talking to one another, and it distracted them from looking at my Bibles. Mm. So I praise God for that. But then when we got to the People's Republic of China, it was very strict. They uh, ordered a guard with us at all times. We couldn't even keep the, um, the key to our room. So as we were praying, I began to, to really ask God, Lord, we risked our lives to come in here. We need a way to be able to reach the Chinese people. People, and we have guards with us the whole time. We don't speak the language, Holy Spirit. How are we going to do and, and this? You know what I found? I went into China when yes. it was rough, uh, and the translators that the government selected for me did not translate what I said. They, they kind of changed everything that was important. Exactly. And we knew that was going to happen. That's what the underground ministry told us. So we were invited to speak at a church as a friendship exchange. So we went up there. I knew I had to, I knew my interpretation was being changed. I knew it was not going to be the way it was. But afterward, they released us to go into this patio area to have a friendship exchange. And the guard had stepped out to go in another area. And he strictly told us, don't say anything about baptisms, don't say anything to anyone. But all of a sudden, those nine of us that were there, I prayed a prayer. Holy Spirit, please give me the words to speak to these people that they will understand. And all of a sudden, the nine out of the 30 that were with me that had smuggled the Bibles in began to speak a Chinese language. And all it was Mandarin. All nine of us began to speak in Mandarin Chinese. The Chinese people in the courtyard lined up, all in our lines, uh, and began to put our hands on their head, on their knees, for us to pray for them. Well, after about seven minutes, the, the man who was in charge of us came in, he broke up, broke it up, and he said, I told you not to speak about baptisms. I told you, write your name in this book. So we went into this room, wrote our name in the book, and they never said anything to us. Through the Holy Spirit, God shows you supernatural strategies. Tell me about the red suit. Yes. Another time I went back to the People's Republic. This was many years later. And uh, I, I was in Hong Kong, and the Lord told me specifically, this time I was really studying the culture, studying what makes people think in Chinese, etc. And the Lord told me, wear a red suit with gold. And I did. I got a red suit, got gold around the edges, and uh, we had gotten 
gotten onto the train this time. And we had our Bibles all in, in our suitcases. And as soon as I started to get off the train, I saw all the police. They were, um, they were military police. Then there were also uh, those who are the Chinese army that are also there. They wear the green and the blue. The blue suited people are the military police. And I thought, how am I going to get all these Bibles, Lord Jesus, across this border? There's so many police and military police. So the Lord said, go up to one of the military leaders and ask him uh, to carry your suitcases. And uh, so I did with the red on because they kind of have superstitious ideas about red. So I did. I went up there. I said, could you help me? You understand English. Uh, what what do you? they think red means? I think they think it means good day, happy, happy luck or whatever. Okay. So I took advantage of that. Okay. Right. I used it as a strategy to get my foot in the door to preach the gospel. And so the two, two. So you were um, like a damsel in, in distress. distress. I need exactly. Help. Yeah. I was like, I came off and I said, oh, I can't carry these. I can't carry these. Could you please help me? And those men came over. They carried my suitcases loaded with Bibles across the border <laughs> and helped me. <laughs> Oh, well, you could have at least given each one of them a Bible. Yes. <laughs> you weren't that bold. You were bold. Well, I, well, one time it did happen. What? I was leaving China, and there was a young man there. He was all by himself. He was a military man. And the Lord said, it's your life or his. And when the Lord told me that, I knew what he meant. He meant you either go to jail or you save his life by giving him a Bible. So I walked up to him and I said, would you like one of these? And he opened it. He took it. He, nothing happened. And I was able to give him the gospel. We have a, a Hebrew word. That is chutzpah, nerve. <laughs> now, Dr. Michelle's anointing, just as it's happening right now, got stronger when she met Mother Teresa. How would you like to walk? in the same kindness and compassion as Mother Teresa. We'll be right back for that contagious anointing. Prayer is an essential part to access every one of God's promises and blessings for your life. And praying daily in your God-given prayer language is so important in light of the times we are living. Introducing the brand new Sid Roth God Talk app. With this new prayer app, you will be able to set a reminder for when you want to pray. Let others know the time you spent in prayer each day for accountability. Take advantage of our worldwide prayer app community to lift your prayer requests to God. It includes a video teaching on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how to effectively pray the supernatural language that God has given you on a daily basis. Watch our TV archives and ISN, our It's Supernatural Network, to build your faith to believe God for the impossible. The app is free and available for iPhone, iPad, or Android devices. Just go to your device's app store and search for Sid Roth's God Talk. Many viewers report testimonies as a result of watching It's Supernatural. I want to thank the Lord for your program. You are a blessing to this generation. I've been suffering and treating a recurring fever for two years, and it's become drug resistant. I watched your show with guest Robert Henderson speaking on the courts of heaven. The fever left immediately when I said the court of heaven prayers with him. To this day, I'm still healed. My name is Ruth. For many years, me and my family have been watching your show, and we are all greatly blessed. When life seems hard, I just turn to your videos, and the Lord touches me, gives me faith to go on. I've received healing and deliverance so many times when enemy has tried to knock me down. The Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, is a great blessing to us through you. If you've been touched watching it Supernatural, share your testimony at sidroth.org praise. You know, I am so intrigued. I never met Mother Teresa. I, I, you spent a lot of time with her, but t 
tell me one thing you really learned from her that is impactful for our viewers. You know, what, what I really learned was how to see Jesus in everyone and never to discriminate against a person, no matter who they are, race, color, creed, to love everyone the way Jesus loved them. And so emulating her life, walking, trying to walk in her footsteps at least. There were no unimportant people. No, mother would take a person off the streets and, and a, someone who was given up for death and she would make that person feel as if they were the most important person in the world. Yes. You were at a meeting in LA. You met her many times, but yes. you met with her in LA. Um, what happened at that time? That was your impartation. Yes, really, it was. I, I was invited to this meeting where Mother was going to be. The house was jammed. It was a little house on Edgware Street in Los Angeles. I don't know how I got invited to go to such mm -hmm. a meeting. There was about 100 people jammed in the house, nowhere to sit. And I came in a little bit late. The house was full. But they ushered me in, and I found myself standing right next to Mother Teresa. The moment I got there, she was told talking, and I started weeping and weeping. I couldn't control Why? myself. Why were you weeping? Because I started feeling the power of God and started feeling something I've never felt to that degree before. And I thought, I'm going to make a fool out of myself in front of Mother Teresa. I'm crying and crying. But she kept looking at me as if to say, I understand why you're crying, and I know what's happening. She didn't say it, but I know she knew it. And I just kept weeping and weeping. But after that experience, I noticed a tremendous difference in my own life. But you got a very important impartation. What happened at your very next meeting My, from that impartation? Yes, from that very next meeting, people began to be healed, set free. Uh, when I would travel in the nations, people would be getting out of wheelchairs and so on. Uh, one time I was going to the Philippines for a huge meeting in the Araneta Coliseum. And this meeting, uh, when I started to land uh, the, in the morning as I was landing, the Lord said, I sent you here for one. And but this was a big meeting. It we're was. expecting tens of thousands. It was. Tens of thousands of people, and they were there that night. But as the plane landed, I heard him say it so clearly, I sent you for one. And I knew the Lord was telling me, he's not going to bring that one to me. I need to look for that one, because that's what I learned from Mother Teresa, to go out and look for the souls, to seek for the lost, the hungry, the broken, those who don't have anyone to love them. So I knew I was on a mission from heaven, not just for the tens of thousands that would be in the Araneta, but to find the one soul. So I went on a journey that morning, uh, the next morning actually, and I decided to go to a place called Tala. Tala was a leprosorium, and I felt in my spirit that that person would be in the leprosorium. So I asked the nurse permission, can you take me through this leprosorium? Just take me through. I would like to give little gifts to the people, pray for them. And uh, I knew in my heart I would find that person there. I know you were looking for one, but yes. what does it look like when you see a bunch of lepers? What did they look like? They were, um, many of them had different forms of leprosy, and some of them were much more advanced. But you others. realize it's highly contagious. Yes. And that didn't bother you. It didn't, because I was on a mission from God. So I went from ward to ward, praying for the people. And I, I thought, is this the end? So I asked the lady, I said, is there one more ward? And she said, yes, but they're not all leprosy patients. There's some other patients, and I didn't know if you'd like to go to that ward. I said, oh, yes, I would. All of a sudden, she said, half of the ward is leprosy, half the ward is other diseases. I walked in, and there she was. She was sitting there. She was around. To me, she looked like she was 10 years old. She was covered with leprosy from her head to her foot. Is and that she a was, painful disease? For some, it is. For, for her particular type of leprosy, it was very painful. She had marks all over her face, on her arms, everywhere. And um, I sta stood there for a few minutes, and then I said, hello, sweetie. I said, would you mind terribly if I put you on my lap and if I got to meet you? And she said, no, ma'am. She was so polite. She said, of course. I bet no one did that to her. I don't think so. So I put her on my lap, 
and I began to just stroke her head, and I asked her, I asked her how old she was, how long she'd been there, what her name was, and I'd been there for about 10 minutes, and I knew I had to leave, and they were telling me, you gotta get back, because it's two hours back to Manila. So before I left, I thought, I said, I'm gonna put my name on these little stickers that she had. I'm gonna write, Jesus loves you, and Auntie Michelle loves you. So I put stickers everywhere I could, and I assigned someone from the Philippines to look after her to go and visit because later I found out she was an orphan. So I um, left her there. I assigned someone to follow up on her. I got an email two weeks later. She was totally healed of her leprosy. <laughs> Hallelujah. My goodness. Now, but there's more. There's more to this story. Yes. What happened as she grew up? As she grew up, she got her degree in teaching. She's a teacher now. She's married, and she's joined my ministry in the Philippines. She prays for people over the phone. I bet a lot of people are healed when she prays she, for them. Yes. When, uh, when I go to the Philippines to pray for people and go on my healing missions, she's part of my team. She lays hands on them, and they're slain in the spirit. She, she has been completely transformed by the power of God. I know one thing. I know God is as interested in you as that little girl that no one wanted anything to do with. No one wanted to touch her. That's the love of our God. A lot of people, they've heard the word anointing. It's used very loosely in a lot of circles. Why do people need the anointing? What is the benefit of the anointing? The first thing that the anointing, that we need in the anointing, is that the anointing will make you fall so in love with Jesus. The anointing will give you the power of God to go through anything. There may be some of you, and I'm feeling right now that I'm speaking to someone who's going through an unbearable trial, and you're wondering, how am I gonna come out of this? I want you to know the anointing is like oil. You know, if you pour oil into any substance, it rises to the top. That's what the anointing will make you do. You will bounce back you will come back after a crisis. The anointing has been given for you to be able not only to bounce back and come back after a crisis, but the anointing is gonna make you the head and not the tail. The anointing is gonna give you the power. The anointing is what the Lord is gonna use to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. So, dear one, whoever you are that I'm speaking to right now, you've been going through trials, tribulations, you don't know how you're gonna make it. I want you to know that the anointing anointing on your life is for a reason. There are purpose properties in the anointing, and those purpose properties are going to come out no matter what you've gone through. God's going to use it for His glory, and God's going to use you for His glory. And I'm reminded Hallelujah. of the scripture that says the anointing destroys that yoke, yes. uh, that, that bondage that you're suffering, that, that persecution that you're going through, that disease that you're fighting, that family member that is so far away from God. It's the anointing anointing that destroys the yoke. Continue. Yes. So I just feel today that there are several people watching this telecast that have bondages in your life. Some of you have bondages of fear. Others of you have bondages in your, in your body. And the Lord wants to break the yokes. What about and, addiction? Yes. The anointing is... is is powerful to break addictions. And right now, in Jesus' name, we release this anointing. It's transferable. We command the anointing into your life. And Lord God, someone right now is raising their hands and they're being anointed. The speaking in tongues is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is coming upon you. But there are others right now, you're seeing visions. There are others of you being anointed right now that tonight when you go to sleep, you are going to dream dreams and God is going to direct you into your destiny. There are others of you today that there's a burning fire in your heart, and that fire is the Lord saying, yes, go forward, my child. Be used of me for my glory. Someone has, has been contemplating, do I go into the ministry? Do I continue in the ministry? God wants you to know both of these answers. The one that's saying yes, the Lord is saying yes, go forward into the ministry. And to those of you who say, I think I'll give up the ministry, God is saying, go forward, get the anointing, and God is going to use this anointing for His honor and glory greater than you could ever ask or think. Hallelujah. Amen. That means so be it. <laughs>
Many viewers report testimonies as a result of watching It's Supernatural. Sid, I had to tell you, I purchased the Supernatural Bible, and wow, I am so blessed studying it. I have a Dakes, the One New Man Bible, an NIV, an Amplified Bible, and the Supernatural Bible is the best I've ever read. Thank you for offering it. Last year, my eyes began turning and I had strabismus in both eyes. My right eye turned outwards and my left eye turned inwards. I put my hands on my eyes when the preacher was praying. My eyes started blinking rapidly. Then the speaker said to go check yourself. So I looked in the mirror to check my eyes and they didn't wander. Then I asked my mom to examine my eyes and she saw that they didn't wander and they still haven't. God healed my eyes completely. If you've been touched watching It Supernatural, share your testimony at sidroth.org slash praise. Next week on It's Supernatural. Hi, I'm Rodney Hogue. How would you live different if you were free of every stronghold in your life? Join me on the next It's Supernatural, and I'm going to share with you how to get free and how to stay free from any demonic stronghold, no matter how big or small.